Gene, I think you should record all night in that voice that you just had. Yes. Mm. That sounds we are so recording. Uh, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that was pretty good. Sleep. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash, Mr. Hand Murdoch. Hi, y'all. And Big D, Dickie Burton. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit chatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with a number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, and Watchmen. Find all the information and past episodes at chatpod.com slash TV. And finally, to hang out with us live, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatpod.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing tonight? Gene, tonight, one of our listeners who goes way back all the way to July of 2017. So he has been with us for quite a while. Our great listener, Ryan C. wrote in and he said, would you please review the 1998 neo-noir science fiction film, Dark City? And our good friend Ryan wrote in and said, my earliest memories of Dark City were seeing a copy of the novelization in the Walmart. I thought it was extremely striking and very interesting. Eventually, I persuaded my mother to rent it for me from the local mom and pop and was absolutely blown away by it. For a young kid watching a show like that, it was one thing that I'd never seen before in my entire life. The atmosphere, the set, design, the cinematography, and the performances by the lead actors was not something that my young mind was prepared for. It has since gone on to be a cult favorite of mine and one that I revisit every year around the fall and Halloween season. While I admit it's not a zero white movie, it holds a very special place in my heart, and I hope you all enjoy it. Love from hot and gross Houston, Texas, Ryan. As you said, Big D, Dark City is a 1998 science fiction film directed by Alex Proyas and starring Rufus Sewell, Kiefer Sutherland, Jennifer Conley, Richard O'Brien, and William Hurt. Sewell plays John Murdoch, an amnesiac man who finds himself suspected of murder. Murdoch attempts to discover his true identity and clear his name while on the run from the police and a mysterious group known only as The Strangers. The film premiered in the United States on February 27, 1998, and was nominated for a Hugo Award for the Best Dramatic Presentation and six Saturn Awards. It received generally positive critiques, even though it was a box office bomb. So we always ask the question where you were and what your memories are of the movie we're covering. Tonight it is Dark City. Big D, we'll start with you. So I've never seen Dark City before this commission, which surprised me. Because if you look at the poster or the the VHS box, uh, the man, he is clearly, it looks like he's time warping. He's on a giant clock. This must be a time travel movie, so I'm surprised I did not see it. So this was the first time experiencing Dark City. This wasn't mine. I've seen this movie a couple of times. Um, I love all things film noir. It's one of my favorite genres. I love all things goth, as we've talked at nauseum on this podcast. I love anything that is dystopian. Uh, so I love this movie. When I saw it for the first time, I thought it was really slick. I thought it was kind of badass. And y'all... It has Kiefer Sutherland in really sexy tiny glasses. It has a really very sexy young Rufus Sewell on rain slick streets cloaked in darkness. Like, y'all, this is very aesthetically my kind of movie. I'm somewhere between the two of you. I haven't seen it a lot of times and I haven't not seen it. Dark City is always playing on screens at goth clubs. So I was familiar with what it looked like. Like I could recognize any scene from it and know who's in it. And I gathered like the basic premise from on-screen action. There's spooky guys floating around chasing a dude and like he's 
trying to solve some sort of mystery. But this was my first time watching the movie with sound and dialogue while not on a <laughs> dance floor. I hope it made more sense this time. I don't think it sounds nearly as fun. Let's hit the trailer. First, there was darkness. Then came the strangers. sleep seeking a cure for their own mortality to steal our thoughts our souls makes us different from them to shape our memories we have much to do to take away all that makes us human it is time who are they Answer me! One of us knows their secret. You saw something, didn't you? I don't think the sun even exists. And one of us... We are running out of time. No escape. ...has the power to stop them. John Murdoch awakens in a hotel bathtub suffering from amnesia. He receives a phone call from Dr. Daniel Schraber, who urges him to flee the hotel to evade a group of men who are after him. In the room, Murdoch discovers the corpse of a ritualistically murdered woman along with a bloody knife. He flees the scene just as the group of pale men in trench coats called the Strangers arrive. So just like the UFO in The Thing Mm -hmm. This movie's theatrical cut spoils nearly all of the mystery with a voiceover that tells us right out of the gate that the strangers are aliens. And it's not the director's fault. In the director's cut, he just starts with Kiefer Sutherland looking at his watch and the movie gets rolling and we're thrust into this mystery. But the studio made him record this voiceover because they thought audiences wouldn't understand what the fuck was going on. And then they show us the reveal of everybody falling asleep at midnight in the opening scene, I can't help but say this movie would be so much better just letting us try to figure out what's happening piece by piece and not throwing these two things at us right away. So they were worried it was going to be confusing. They did the complete opposite. They give this reveal, but then yet they try to hold on to this big twist until the end and they hold on to it way too long. It's clear that this is not Earth, but then it, they, they wait until the very end to spoiler alert, show us that they're up in space. Either reveal both or keep both a secret. But by giving away one, the end loses any power it would have had. I do have to give some props to Alex Proyas, the director, though, for really trying on this voiceover. Because if you think about like Blade Runner, when Harrison Ford had to do it, he's like, okay, so it's Blade was- Runner. Oh, my God. Yeah. I hate your hatred for Blade Runner. Like, every time. It makes me so mad. Do you not think... That Blade Runner did not need the Harrison Ford voiceover where he sounds utterly disinterested in being there. I mean, Harrison Ford kind of has a career from looking disinterested, right? <laughs> like that's like how he acts. So I don't know if I'm going to buy it there. But I will say I'm, I'm with you guys on this. Although I normally pick up a twist pretty quick. I knew that something was off, but I didn't necessarily know that they were floating around in outer space. I mean, that one. But I will say this. A few episodes ago, Big D, you asked. Mm-hmm asked whether or not certain like kind of gothy movies or industrial world type movies were like derivative of one another and i can't remember what episode that was do you guys remember i think it's every movie every, we that's do that's it's like a god there we go thing. it's yeah. literally everything we do right but you were like you know these these types of movies all look the same and i remember gene and i like in tandem were like 
Because they are. <laughs> because I think that movies like this one that fall into this category and they don't feel derivative of other things, they just look like this time period. And I find it really comforting in some way because these are the movies that I watched most often growing up in like my formative years. They look just like this. You've got this movie, you've got The Crow, you've got Hackers, you've got The Matrix. Like we could go on and on and on. And all these movies feel the same and the aesthetic feels the same. It feels so fucking slick. Like, I think it's so much fun. I think that you see immediately when these movies open up, like the second that we get from the voiceover and he says, I betrayed my own kind. And then it zooms in into the streets and the way that the rain is reflecting on the streets and they pan up to like gold and black buildings that are cast in these grays. Like, you know what it's going to be. I'm like immediately drawn in. There's a reason why the decor and the style of the goth industrial scene has remained largely unchanged for like 40 years. And there's a reason why legions of kids today are adopting the quote unquote witchy or goth looks with absolutely no connection to the music or the culture. It's just visually timeless. It's a look unto itself. And of course it's going to be in the slickest movies because it looks great. My cousin who's in his 20s, he DJs a night called The Crypt. And I was like, oh shit, my cousin's a goth DJ? No, it's house music, it's trance, it's like regular party music for kids, but all the decorations and the marketing are spooky because dark is just cool. Yeah, and there's something kind of interesting about it because, like, I work within the education system and I see all these kids walking around in, like, these old school, like, nine inch nail shirts. And a couple of them have, like, Manson shirts. And it's just things that, like, I wore from, like, 96 to 2000. I've gone up to a couple of them, like, hey, like, yo, like, did you get that from your mom? Do you know these people? And they have no idea they buy them at like fucking Target. But I agree with you. Like they want to be a part of it. And I feel sometimes like I've missed my time because like the cool kids now wear this kind of stuff. And I'm like, yo, like we were originals, right? And maybe it's because it's so addictive. Like this look is so addictive and everything like this kind of runs together for me. So I may be alone in this next idea, but I got such major vibes with these gentlemen In the episode of Buffy, Hush, you've got the little guys that walk around, right? And they're called the gentlemen. In this movie, they're called the strangers. And I know, yes, I know the people in this movie, the strangers, they talk and and the gentlemen don't. And yes, I know the strangers have metal teeth and these guys don't. But for me... They totally gave off the same vibe. And then add to that that they're kind of all floaty, like the gentlemen are in that episode of Hush. And... It may be that my favorite dark things run together, but I felt like I was watching things that like paid homage to one another that were just like a couple of years apart. Yeah, it's like the uh, the hands of blue from Firefly, right? The, The same thing. It was this vibe that was pervasive during that time. Ash, I've read some reviews of Dark City and the most shocking part is when people bag on the strangers outfits i don't get it i think they look cool as shit like a billy corgan circa everlasting gaze yes and they were my favorite part of the movie this movie wouldn't be what it is or have much to look at if it wasn't for these guys and the backdrop Uh, So this may surprise you as the non-goth member of the podcast but i'm going to give you (laughs) the every man i think perspective on goth Ash, you've already said, you know, it all looks alike because it is a similar world. And, and what I've gotten for the aesthetics is we have to have some urban decay. Uh, we have to have dark nights, rainy, preferably, mm-hmm. wet streets, lots mm-hmm. of leather and pasty complexions. So once we get all that into a movie, we can now cast all of our characters in leather. And a lot of times it goes bad. You remember Marlboro? <laughs> what was it? Uh, it was Harley Davidson, the Marlboro Man. Great movie. The three bad guys. Fantastic. Had the leather outfits. They were trying for the look, but it didn't work. Here, I'm going to be honest. The strangers look fucking cool. It mm. is timeless. It is simple. Black leather never goes out of style. The way they walk around, the, the, they're very tall. They're imposing. The way they talk, that clicking noise with their teeth was very unnerving. I was listening with headphones. I, I kept kind of looking behind me. You could you could hear them. Even though the weapons they have, they're space aliens. They're in space. It's a knife, very low tech. It always looks, again, timeless. A blade will always work. But did, did either of you see Star Trek Nemesis? 
Tom Hardy? No. I did. Okay, so you'll know. The Romulans in that movie, Star Trek Nemesis, it's a bad one. Tom Hardy plays Shinzon, who is a Romulan clone copy of Jean-Luc Picard, who was involved in this entire subplot about trying to to leverage Picard into you know releasing some secrets. Uh it's a cool look. I mean it works across many many different movies, but very few to this level of success. We have now told you more facts about Star Trek Nemesis than we have about <laughs> Dark City. <laughs> they kind of look Egyptian in Star Trek Nemesis. No, oh, I think it's very close to this. Very close. As a man who is marrying a woman of Italian descent and has a Kurdish mother and sister, I know I'm playing with fire with my next comment, but I could not stop staring at Jennifer Conley's mustache during this movie. <laughs> we first see her as a jazz singer in a cocktail lounge. She's in this like sexy, sparkly dress and the red lipstick and the spotlight. Poof, it's on her. She's trying to bring some like sizzle to the screen that we're the way Jennifer Conley does. And all I can see is this caterpillar living on her top. <laughs> no. no matter what was happening on screen, I could not pay attention to any of her scenes because my brain was going mustache, mustache, mustache. What kind of TV you have, Gene? I don't know TV brands. It's a big one. Is it a couple years old? Does, is it 4K? Sarah and I go to the appliance store and we just look in the scratch and dents and I go, well, give us your, your fucked up TV, your fucked up washer, whatever. And that's what ends up on the wall. It's just refurbished. I don't know. It's a thing. It's good enough to see a mustache on Jennifer Conley. It has to be good. I, because I have a Vizio that's about eight years old. It goes up to 1080p. I have an Apple TV that does do 4K, but the, the monitor, it it is obviously not good enough because I did not notice the hair. I was I was paying close attention. The picture looks great, clean, but it wouldn't have mattered to me. I'll be honest with you. She could have a full grown, like, like, like a five o'clock shadow. I would be completely fine. I would know you could shave it, you could wax it, because Jennifer riding that coin-operated horse in Career Opportunities, and all of you guys out there, you know what I'm talking about, that made me feel things. I feel so bad, because every time I think about Jennifer Connelly, I think of the end of Requiem for a Dream. Like They're just so ingrained to me. But what's so funny about you saying this is when I was doing my research about this movie, I was Googling things about Gark. Dark City. And one of the first things that pops up is why does Jennifer Connelly suddenly have a noticeable mustache? And it's because of the power of Blu-ray. Like when this film came out, I don't think it looked like that. I think now that we've got such better technology, we've got Blu-ray devices, we've got just better screens in general. Poor thing. Hold up. You're saying that when you look this up online, someone wrote about this? Yes. So it's a real thing. It's not just me. No, it's like a real thing. Thank like, you. Like genuinely. You. Yes. Indeed. And like people are like, holy shit. And they were showing like the original pixelation versus like now how high def it is. And mm. I'm wondering like how these movies are going to continue to age. Like in 20 years, are we just going to see like people's veins like underneath their skin when they were like filmed in like 1982? I just don't understand. They shot this scene close up on her face, spotlight on her face. That bright lipstick. The red, the, yeah. You know, the, the trademark Jennifer Conley eyebrows. Like, you can see it plain as day. Why did nobody say, let's let's wax that thing? No, I want to believe this is some kind of a visual artifact in the conversion to Blu-ray. I, don't, I can't believe this. But it, again, it wouldn't matter. It's natural. She's beautiful. Uh, and, and I would take her however she was. I would just, you know, give her unlimited spa treatment. She can go laser, laser treatment. She's great. She's good to go. Which is a big deal. You take her as she is or you give her unlimited laser treatments. I was just about to ask the same thing. I would kiss her wispy mustache. It would not affect me. I think she's she's beautiful. But in a cast full of, of, of great actors, like you just said, Jennifer Conley, we got William Hurt. It is Emmy winners, BAFTA winners and nominees, Oscar winners and nominees. You would expect all of these performances to shine. I think William Hurt stands out the most. But Kiefer Sutherland. His portrayal of Dr. Daniel Schraber, it was like a pebble in my shoe. I don't know what he was thinking. He was doing some kind of cadence with his, it was like a, (gasps) what (gasps) are we going to do? It was like he was always out of breath. I was left waiting, just just spit it out, doctor, spit out the line. Uh, Come on, get to the point. 
Did you want him to call up John and be like, hello, John, this is Dr. Schraber, and I'd like to tell you, you're in great danger. You need to get out of there now. Ha, ha, ha. No, you're nuts, Big D. I absolutely loved what Sutherland was doing here. He was perpetually out of breath. He's shrunk himself somehow into this role of a physically feeble, vulnerable genius who is racked with guilt and everything about him says don't trust him because if we'd immediately trusted him the path would be too clear he had to be this mysterious kind of small figure he's like a golem of sorts yeah i think and he's the only one clearly affected by being in outer space like the altitude's (laughs) really high like he's out of breath the air is thin and i think like the limp that he has it's perfect in like that scene where he's floating in the pool and they come in to find him like the way that he acts in this movie he does not look like 1998 Kiefer sutherland he looks like a broken down feeble guy and he looks like what i wanted everyone in 12 monkeys to look like in the real world Yes. that were affected by this virus like that's what i wanted them to look like i loved it i, I would have rather had him a little quieter reserved a bit swarmy but instead he sounds like like Kiefer sutherland with asthma having an episode and trying to get his lines out lame it didn't sound mysterious to me it sounded like overacting like method acting like he was trying to force this creation on the screen and it, for me it didn't work but you're okay with aaron paul and westworld no, I never said that. No. Following clues, Murdoch learns his own name and <laughs> finds out he has a wife named Emma. Police Inspector Frank Bumstead also wants Murdoch as a suspect in a series of murders committed around the city. Pursued by the strangers, Murdoch discovers he has psychokinesis, which the strangers also possess and refer to as tuning. He manages to use the powers to escape from them. One part of this movie that always makes me laugh is the big scene on the billboard. So he goes out, he finds the Shell Beach billboard, he climbs up there. And then first you've got this chattering kid who's dressed just like the rest of the strangers. And he looks like one of those toys where it's just the mouth that kind of like bounces up and down, but like it's like personified in human form. Mm -hmm. And he has no purpose in this movie other than to stand there and just look like a creepy kid with chattering teeth. But then you've also got the fact that they break out these giant knives, which are like a steampunkers like wet dream the way that like those handles are shaped and then you realize that their trench coats have this kind of shiny sheen to them and it's supposed to be scary but the way that it happens with all the action it just winds up being really funny and i'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing i think that there's something very charming about movies that have these campy parts And that feel ridiculous, but there's something endearing about them. And I don't think they meant for this to be camp, but it is super campy. And you guys also agree that this part was completely ridiculous, right? So I wasn't laughing at the characters or their outfits. I didn't find any of that campy or silly or anything. The action, though, like that fight on the billboard, Mm -hmm. that shit was straight up Looney Tunes. I was cracking up. I half expected someone to get like squished by a falling anvil and then waddle off or like get hit by a frying pan (laughs) with a big like (laughs) pang noise. And every time one of the strangers gets injured, it's like an ink blot. Like they just splatter. They go overboard with it. Yes. There's got to be some slapstick intent there. I think you needed this creepy kids to kind of balance out the slapstick. We talked about Pet Cemetery, the kid, the possessed kid. Kids are inherently scary. Sometimes you just even Emma scares me sometimes. And Mr. Sleep, he he bites people's fingers. I thought he was going to turn out to be some of the leadership in like child form. But you needed him. It just occurred to me, Ash. I, I, I cracked the case here. Okay. It's an Australian director. Mm. Think about like Mad Max, right? All the like Mad Max movies. Costuming Ooh. and action. It's yeah. very reminiscent of, yeah, it's Mad Max. That's fair. Yeah, very true. A little sped up nature to the action. Mm-hmm. Very, yeah. very Mad Max. Good. So now we got Murdoch's being chased around. <laughs> Thank you. By these, these Good job, beings. Gene. Yeah, very, Gene, great job. You get, you get, I'm going to mark this down. You got a star for today. You got a gold star. Gene gets to eat today. <laughs> yeah, Gene. Good job, buddy. Way to keep it up. So Murdoch, he's spending most of his time investigating the mystery of his identity. He's fumbling around the city, searching for clues. Uh, but simultaneously, he's running for his life from the the slapstick assassins and the the demon children. He's already found out that he's got a power. And I think it's his duty to try to learn how to use it. We talked in Krull. You give Krull the ultimate weapon, but yet he doesn't practice. 
Why doesn't Murdoch go find a safe place and, you know what, refine his powers? Because he's going to need it against this army if he has any chance of surviving. My dude, you're telling me you wake up in a bathtub. You don't know who you are. You find a carved up Carl girl in your hotel Mm-mm. room. No. You get chased by floating dudes who want to kill you. The city keeps falling asleep at midnight, but you don't. And your primary focus is going to be, what are my superpowers? I think he's got some bigger questions to answer. Well, I think he doesn't even realize that he has superpowers. Like, I think that maybe this is what he's always had or this is what he's always been. And so, like, if he can find out who he is, he can find out where they come from and how to use them. Yeah, perhaps he's not seeing that coming out of his head when he's tuning. And so he just looks over and is like, whoa, there's a fucking door. That's weird. Yeah. Oh, the floor collapsed. That's weird. I squinted and some bricks fell down. Which would have been the better way to present tuning, by the way. Yeah. Okay, so maybe he thinks he's concussed. I'll give you that. (laughs) And he's thinking that's his power. But (laughs) when the doctor tells him you have these abilities, at that point, go hide, go refine them. Work on them. He doesn't even attempt. He's fighting and running for his life. And not once does he think, okay, how did I throw the doctor? How did I create that door? How could I move the building and collapse onto these guys? He's not a killer, Big D. He's a man who rescues goldfish. No. Murdoch explores the anachronistic city where nobody seems to notice the perpetual nighttime. At midnight, he watches as everyone except himself falls asleep as the strangers physically arrange the city as well as change people's identities and memories. Murdoch learns that he came from a coastal town called Shell Beach, a town familiar to everyone, though nobody knows how to get there, and all of his attempts to do so are unsuccessful for varying reasons. Meanwhile, the strangers inject one of their men, Mr. Hand, with memories intended for Murdoch in an attempt to predict his movements and track him down. Inspector Bumstead eventually catches Murdoch. They confront Schraber, who explains that the strangers are extraterrestrials who use corpses as their hosts. Schraber reveals that Murdoch is an anomaly who inadvertently awoke when Schraber was in the middle of imprinting his last identity as a murderer. So I don't think we can understand how beautiful this film looks. It is well-crafted. It, it, it's engaging visually from the moment that you see it. And we get to a point that really impressed me. I can remember how I felt the first time I saw Inception, when they're visualizing, creating, and manipulating the world around them in real time. There's that scene, everybody knows it if you've seen the movie, where Cobb starts messing around with the physics of a dream, and he's bending and folding the streets of Paris. Dark City is 12 years before Inception. But nevertheless, they pulled it off, I thought, in a satisfying visual way. There was limitations budget-wise and what they could do with the technology. But it impressed me. If you said in 1998, visualize folding buildings and creating things and squeezing them within a city, I don't think I could have asked for anything better than this. And the effect was impressive i just couldn't help but wonder what the body count was because like haiti's 2010 earthquake killed more than 300,000 people how many people do you think die every time the strangers decide to do their nightly construction projects there's like oh, expand this building crush this building subsume the ground like why bother doing them like they don't play a role in the experiments these guys are conducting the experiments for those people who haven't seen the movie or don't remember they're like hey let's give this guy the memories of a killer and then make all the facts around his life support the fact that he's a killer, and then see if he actually becomes a killer, if that's in his nature or not. What the fuck do buildings have to do with that? Because they're cool. Oh. And it makes these sets, like, really amazing. Um, Whether you're, like, into steampunk, again, if you're into goth, if you're somebody who just likes dark, creepy shit, like, there's so much to look at in this movie. We've talked about the clothing, but it's beyond just that. Like, the color of the bricks, the way the light bounces off of everything in this movie, including whenever the streets get wet. And then let's talk about Kiefer Sutherland. There is this scene where he's helping the strangers reorganize. He's re-imprinting them. And there's this dinner table with this family. And in the scene, he is wearing this three-piece suit, this amazing ascot, this beautiful overcoat, like this tiny little bowler hat, those great little glasses. And I like pause the movie because he's just like orgasmic to look at the way that he's dressed. Like he's dressed so well and everything around him is done so well. And that's the thing about this movie. As I, as I realized when I did pause the scene that it may be more style 
than substance because I do think that parts of this movie are silly, but there's nothing more attractive than the way that the movie looks, the way it sounds, the way it feels when you watch it. And I know, Jean, you talked in the beginning about how you watched it on the walls of goth clubs, and this was the first time you really heard it. And for me, I think that the experiences of seeing it silently in those clubs make so much sense to me why they play it because it's just like eye candy. Mm -hmm. And unlike a lot of other movies that are visually incredible but don't make sense, the anachronism here makes sense because they establish that the strangers built the city off the memories of the people they abducted. The memories that are going to stand out the most are the most memorable things, the most distilled moments of style and, and, and fashion and impression, right? So everything from the cars to the phones is going to be the most memorable form of that thing. And that gave the set decorators an incredible opportunity to pick and choose the coolest shit from each era and have it make sense. What didn't make sense is the strangers deciding that the only way to track down John Murdoch in a city that appears to be like the size of Manhattan is to imprint one of their own with Murdoch's memories. Really? Like that's the only way? Possibly infect your hive mind and end up killing Mr. Hand just to try to predict what John's doing. John Murdoch spends the whole movie stumbling through streets. He's breaking shit. He's yelling in the middle of the night. He doesn't even sleep when everyone else does. Literally, the world is frozen except for him, and these fuckers can fly. <laughs> How about instead of chilling in your underground click rave, you get off your asses, you do some aerial surveillance, you'd find him in like a half hour tops. Yeah, but here's another option. Why don't we just freeze time for more than just a couple minutes? Let's freeze time for maybe a day or two because we don't want to freeze it so long that people die. Then you systematically search the city. Westworld season four just ended, and they showed it's much easier to track an outlier in a city when everyone else freezes. They're the only ones moving. I think you can find them. But maybe the aliens, again, aren't that smart. We're assuming they're this great intelligence. But maybe they're just not. And that's why they're dying. I've always found the plot of this movie like kind of interesting with the whole midnight bit. And so if you've not seen it, you know, every day these people have the same day over and over again, but it's a different day because they play like a different character. And I think that that's kind of interesting and also really, really scary because the idea is kind of like what I've always felt with like goldfish, right? So goldfish, they forget everything at a certain point. They have very short memories. And so they are these really unfortunate creatures because the entirety of their lives exists within the time that they remember, which is not very long. So they only remember the last few minutes. So like if they're hungry, they like been hungry, like their whole lives. If they're upset about something, that's the thing they've been upset about their entire lives. And as they're dying, like they've literally been dying their entire life. And there's something really Really nuts about that. And so here you've got this world that is so dystopian because of the fact that like identity in dystopian worlds, it, it already is in question because usually like the government's controlling it or like an entity's controlling it. But for here, it's worse because identity literally means nothing because identity is assigned and it's temporary. And because of like the temporariness, you can't actually believe anything or feel anything or anything mean anything just like a goldfish. And I love that about this movie because that is a different type of dystopian plot that i think we've seen before big d you mentioned earlier westworld season four and i think there are lots of parallels between dark city and westworld in the vein of what ash is talking about you got hosts on loops living experiments narratives being written and then imprinted on subjects and that reminded me of a concept that westworld and dark city present on the periphery it's a logical extension of what ash was talking about and if you guys will bear with me on like a joe rogan rant here <laughs> we don't really know that the past actually happened like even right now i don't know that i really existed two seconds ago it's just a memory i have i, I could have been activated right now and everything else is just you know imprinted in my brain and oddly that's one of the few things that makes me more comfortable with death if the me of yesterday already ceases to exist and the whole world of yesterday is dead today, then we're pretty much dying all the time and it's not so bad. And we're seeing it here with these guys. It's like your life lasts 
one day, as Ash was saying, everything is distilled into that one day, and then it's a different life the next day. Who's to say that's not happening to us? It possibly could. Thanks, Big D. <laughs> that's not a good answer there. I was just saying. <laughs> <laughs> good Dick job, Gene. Yeah, no, good job, Gene. Goals are too. He's so smart. But Gene, I think you are downplaying uh, the the ties to Westworld. I felt like I was watching Westworld again. It goes much deeper. It's the command to sleep. The hundreds of people in the streets just falling over or freezing. You got Mr. Books, who's like Dr. Ford with his personal zoo. And he's seeking out what constitutes a soul. They give them a cornerstone of a painful death. I felt like Eddie was ri- writing season four of Westworld. This is actual dialogue. None of it seems real. It's like I've just been dreaming this life. And when I finally wake up, I'll be somebody else. Somebody totally different. Sounds like Christine. Are we, in fact, the sum of our memories? This is bringing up season four traumatic events. But again, the way they set this up, it makes no narrative sense. If each day you're rewriting without reconnecting the narratives, if we learned anything from Westworlds, they will collapse. If you're rewriting who people are and what they do, you don't have jobs, you don't have factories, you don't have everyone's going to wake up without a purpose, without something to do if there's no coherent narrative that ties the whole world together. I think the idea here though is it isn't a series of loops that are connected to each other for a working world, but rather it's just a series of experiments. So everybody is actively in some experiment at the time and so their entire identity that day and the entire function is they're not really a cop they're not really trying to solve a mystery. Yeah. They're they're just performing an experiment and you stay in that role as long as it takes for the experiment to be complete or you die and then you get recycled into a new experiment. You see, but I think it's so much worse than that. The experiment itself is like its core do memories drive us to be the people that we are? Because we've talked at length, if you listen to our Westworld podcast, like about the complexity of memory and the fact that the more you remember something, the less accurate that memory is. And so these memories are recycled by the doctor and the strangers over and over and over again. So they get less connected to their original source and they get corrupted and more corrupted. And so you inject the memories of a killer to see if he's going to be a killer. And eventually those memories would change so much that like he would become something else. Like there's something really terrifying about that because our memories are all that we have. And whether I've just been programmed and woke up just now, or I've been this for 39 years as I believe that I have been like my memories make me who I am. And if you're fucking with my memories, then I'm actually no one. And something we haven't touched on, the idea of love. And, and the, I think the movie touches on it, but never goes too deep into it, right? Between Murdoch and, and Emma, his, his wife. Are their souls combined together or is it just the memories they have of each other? And I wish the movie would have gone a little bit deeper into that because they're, they explore, they like touch on this love story and then they walk away from it. And uh, I think it could have been a stronger movie for it. So I have to ask this at this point, whether or not it sounds stupid or not. So the strangers, they're trying to find out what makes a soul and whether or not they can then incorporate that and and help their their kind survive, right? They're a hive mind, though. Are they trying to find one soul to share amongst all of them or individual souls and somehow then break up the hive? Wouldn't that inherently change who they are? So I'm sure I'll get this wrong. People write in hosts at shatthemovies.com or go to shatpod.com and use this speak by pitch to leave us your idea on what this is. But my impression is they don't have the capability to be individuals. And that's what they're trying to learn is what makes the individual so that they can employ that to survive. And also remember, they're seeking out immortality. Like that's why they leave. They're seeking for an answer to their own mortality. And what is more immortal than having something that lives beyond like the physical body that breaks down. And so like they're trying to harness this power of a soul that goes on after the corporal form goes away. Yeah, but they control physical objects. I would believe that they could roll back the effects of time. That they could cure disease. I, I think that you, we need to go to superpowers 101 because like those are two <laughs> very different superpowers. Why? Why? Telekinesis and the ability to time turn. Hold is... on. But this, this isn't telekinesis. They're not moving a pencil across the table. They're creating objects. They're stretching a table 
You you created a table and plates and clothes and a, an entire mansion from nothing. Why couldn't you also then create an arm on someone who was born without one? I'm going to go out on a limb and say because they can't. <laughs> okay, I like I it. just, wait, I want to- We're not talking about creating limbs here. Wait, I know, We're talking wait, about sorry, escaping like, death. You're talking about right. turning back time and you're like, and that means they can put an arm on a person that doesn't no. have one. Like, I mean, okay, okay. I'm, I, okay, I didn't verbalize that correctly. I'm no. saying if they can manipulate objects to the molecular level, uh-huh. that means they could cure disease theoretically in a physical body. If there was a tumor, they could remove it. Okay. If there was something wrong physically with a person's genetic makeup, right. they can manipulate to the molecular level and fix that. What do you think is wrong with the strangers? Do you think they have like a, a flu or cancer? <laughs> they're, they're looking for immortality. They can be immortal. <laughs> no, they can't. No, they being can't. Able That's the point of the movie. Being able to manipulate things at the molecular level doesn't mean you can manipulate time. You can fix the body. I'm I'm saying you can't oh manipulate time, God. but I can reverse <laughs> all signs of aging. You <laughs> okay? Why do you grow old? Why do you grow old? Because it's in our genetic code. Because your cells you reproduce down. that exactly. You break down, and the cells replace themselves less frequently, and your body overall degrades. Your systems fail. Here we can fix the systems. Big D, they're living in corpses. It's not the body that's the problem. <laughs> Then I'm going to make a synthetic body. We're back to Westworld. But they can manipulate things at the molecular level. I oh disagree. God. No. <laughs> Pick a better form. Move on. Why is this pirate movie about guys on boats? <laughs> I don't get it. Wouldn't it be better to just be land pirates? No. <laughs> Why don't they go to space? I don't know. If, were you hanging out with Roger this weekend? No. I'm, I'm... No. I was not. Murdoch, Schraber, and Bumstead embark to find Shell Beach and break through a wall, revealing outer space. The men are confronted by the strangers who hold Emma hostage. In the ensuing fight, Bumstead falls through the hole into space, revealing the city is a deep space habitat surrounded by a force field. The strangers force Schraber to imprint Murdoch with their collective memory, believing Murdoch to be the culmination of their experiments. He instead inserts false memories in Murdoch, which reestablished his childhood as years spent training and honing his tuning skills and learning about the strangers and their machines. Murdoch awakens, frees himself, and battles with the strangers, defeating their leader, Mr. Book, in a psychokinetic fight high above the city. You cannot tell me that there isn't a special place in actor heaven for actors that know how stupid what they're doing is, but they commit to it anyway. And a perfect example of a person that would be in an actor heaven here is Rufus Sewell. This above ground fight is silly and it could have been much, much worse if he hadn't have taken it so seriously, but he did. He's squinting. He's furrowing his brow. Like he saved it from being just like utter, just ridiculousness. I have nothing against his performance. There's just no saving that tuning effect that we talked about earlier. It's painfully dumb. (laughs) It looks ridiculous from the first time we see it used. And it just gets worse as the movie goes on. And so, Ash, I'm not disagreeing with you. He tried his best. But when we see John Murdoch and Mr. Book like brain blasting each other for 10 (laughs) minutes, we got to give a wipe for that. If we punish Dune... For the weirding module, we got to give Dark City a solid wipe for this bullshit. I don't know. I guess I just thought it looked just as bad as it does in Donnie Darko when, like, the wormholes come out from his chest. Like, that's what it looked like to me. So I thought it looked better than that. This shit gets fucking wild. There's a part where there's, like, a a mid, like, a, a, a tumble salt. Like, you're spinning head over heels into a water tower that, that then subsequently explodes and you have that typical Avenger scene you mentioned, Gene, where two characters are faced off and they're using their power against each other, shoving each other back and forth. It is a visual mess. Do you give them credit for going for it? Because they no. just went for it. I would have thought less. Less is more. Yeah. Let's keep it simple. Don't show it to us. Show it from a distance. Listener John Hut sent me a link on Discord to a Big Bang Theory clip about Raiders of the Lost Ark. And first, John... I want to thank you for finally popping my Big Bang Theory cherry and confirming my suspicion that it is the dumbest sitcom on earth. But 
The idea behind the scene was correct, though. Indiana Jones played no important role in Raiders of the Lost Ark. The Nazis would have fucked themselves anyway. He didn't stop anything. And that's the same case in Dark City. The movie only needed to be about 10 minutes long. Dr. Schraber tries to imprint John Murdoch. Murdoch tune blasts him away. Schraber goes, aha, this guy can tune. Goes to his lab, cooks up the injection that turns John into Neo from the Matrix. Tells John, hey, these guys are coming after you. Inject this. You can kick the shit out of the stranger. Save the planet at the end. Movie's over. What the fuck was the rest of this about? Why was there Detective Bumstead? What the fuck was he doing? What's John's wife doing there? Like, none of this matters. It's a syringe and a guy that can shoot shit out of his head. Why does the inspector drive around with an accordion in his back seat? Because it reminds him of his mother. <laughs> These are questions that people need to, well, we need answers. If you ask Ash, because it's cool. Because <laughs> it looks good. Because it looks good. It's a beautiful accordion. I know it does. See, you agree. Well, after learning Emma has been reimprinted, Murdoch creates an actual shell beach by flooding the area within the force field with water and forming mountains and beaches. He rotates the habitat toward the star it had been turned away from, and the city experiences sunlight for the first time. He opens a door leading out of the city and steps out to view the sunrise. Beyond him is a pier where he finds the woman he knew as Emma, now with new memories and a new identity as Anna. Murdoch reintroduces himself as they walk to Shell Beach, beginning their relationship anew. So in the end, John Murdoch saves the day, he gets the girl, and he goes to the beach. But I can't help but be worried for the inhabitants (laughs) of Dark City. Like, for one, you can't just point your city at the sun and call it a day, right? Is it day all the time now? Is it going to get hot? Like, are they used to this climate? Maybe you, I don't know, build some farmland. Before you build yourself a beach, where the fuck is food going to come from? Did you just use the entire water supply to make a beach? I I sure hope that Schraber and all the other stuff that he put in that injection, like combine the (laughs) knowledge of every single scientific (laughs) discipline known to man, or these people are fucked. There's something with this floating city because, again, nobody flew out into space. So like the actual laws of physics don't apply so it's got to have some sort of force field around it and maybe that includes like a sun shield yeah th- uh, this is the one thing i can answer there is a force field because you can see when the, the air hitting it as they're going out but i have questions is there a limitation to the power can he build a full planet like uh you know in the the genesis the genesis device in star trek again can we create a full world uh can we maybe turn this into a ship or something that propels back to earth I th- you got to hope that there's more to it. And is he going to tell people what's going on? What's he going to do? Dude, he doesn't know what Earth is. Can the machine take him back in time and make him immortal? Well, hopefully somebody has a memory. But no, they don't know where they're from. <laughs> they, they don't. So really, <laughs> fuck. They're all doomed. <laughs> they're all doomed. Big D, you, you talked at Reservoir Dogs <laughs> about all the Tarantino movies being in the same universe. And I, in true Gene Lyons fashion, swatted that notion away as being fans needing to find new fucking hobbies, right? Get out of the fucking metaverse. But I've got a shared universe theory here, okay? Dark City is a prequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm. Follow me here. Mr. Hand, he realizes he's dying. He's been corrupted by the homicidal version of John Murdoch. So he somehow escapes Dark City and he finds himself in the galaxy of transsexual Transylvania and then eventually travels to Earth and adopts the new identity of Riff Raff. Because you can't tell me that Richard O'Brien isn't basically playing the same character in both movies. Like he's Riff Raff in this. He's like, hello. (laughs) Hello, Emma. Your name is now Anna. Yes. When does he grow the hunchback, though? Uh, that's as a result of the uh, injection. It's John Murdoch is corrupting him physically too. Or it could be the tumor. He doesn't have the ability to molecularly oh, like that's work right. and like turn back. And that's you know, Big D's theory is true here. The real cancer is up here. <laughs> <laughs> now it's the time of the podcast where we give our chat score. For Dark City, our chat scores are of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get out of your respective butts. Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is floating around in an Art Deco spookscape with mm-hmm. your fur-lined coat and switchblade dagger, putting people to sleep with a wave of a hand. 
and five wipes is an absolute disaster. It is spending all your mental ability creating and recreating a city to better understand what makes humans individuals, only to find out you are wrongly looking in the head for what lives in the heart. Ash, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for Dark City? All right. This is a silly movie. But I do love it. I think it's fun. I think it's stylish as fuck. It's like a very like gothic Great Gatsby. And I would watch it again and again and again. But I do know that it's not perfect. So I originally was going to give this two wipes. But then I started thinking about the tuning effect, some of the other silliness, the Looney Tunes, like Wildy Coyote moments. And so I added a wipe for that. And it hurts because I want to stay true to our rating system. I don't want to be Big D and have a Red Dawn moment. And so I'm going to give it what I feel like it actually probably deserves, which is three wipes. That is some serious discipline. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Ash. Think, do I get a gold star? Gold star for you too. Yes. No, you can't give away gold stars. I got a. Oh, he can here. totally give away <laughs> yes, gold yes. stars, sir. So, so listen. I'm, I'm going to surprise <laughs> you here. I'm, I'm going to come in, Ash, a little bit higher. So I'm going to balance this out. I'm going to. You want it to go a little bit better. I'm going to help you with that. I thought it was a better film. Surprisingly, I think it's beautiful. I think the cast is exceptional. Maybe not all their performances, but it's an exceptional cast. The mystery is compelling, even though they reveal a little bit too much in the beginning. It keeps building on itself. I tried to figure out where it was going to go. But then the conclusion just takes a giant shit on everything the film has built. We didn't need the Matrix Neo flying around and then Truman sailing off to the end of Seaside. (laughs) Sometimes less is more. If the movie had dialed it back, even 10%, it could have been a great film. Leave some mystery. Leave something to our mind and our imagination. But for me still, I don't regret watching it. There's a lot worse, a lot better. So for that, I'm going 2.5. Wow. I don't say this often, but TV studios are drooling over multiverse and altered reality show concepts like the peripheral. Dark City, it lends itself much more to a TV treatment than a film treatment. Mm. Like to fit all these concepts and all these storylines into a 100 minute package, the pace had to be frantic. The edits were jumpy as fuck. You were here, then you were there, then you were here. What the fuck's going on? And the mystery didn't have time to marinate. They should have really dragged this out over 10, 20 episodes. Conceptually, this movie's cool as fuck. You said it, Ash. Stylistically, delicious. But the Mm. dialogue, the action... The effects and the breaches of logic really hurt it. Applause for the surprise boobs, but it's still a three and a half wiper for me. So with three and a half wipes from me, two and a half wipes from Big D, and three wipes from Ash, that gives us an average wipe score of three wipes for Dark City. So Gene, with an even three wipes across the board, that now ties us in the two or three spot with Christmas Vacation, Commando, Revenge of the Nerds, The Boondock Saints, Over the Top, Grease 2. Mortal Kombat, Red Dawn, that is disgusting. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and what do we always say finds its way into these movies? Fucking Fifth Element. Nope. Blade Runner? Blade Runner, correct. Blade, Blade Runner is a three-white movie. So that's, uh, that's a pretty far down the down the pantheon of chat, but uh, I still think I agree, Ash. Blade Runner deserves justice. Yes, it does. If you took the pacing from Dark City and the story of Blade Runner... Now you got yourself a winner. So make it happen. I think they actually did already. <laughs> it's called the Blade Runner 2045. <laughs> no, I think the definitive version, like version 700 of Blade Runner, uh-huh. the definitive cut is the one that is universally accepted as the best. I think that's the one we should review. Blade Runner is back. amazing. It's just, it's amazing. Well, thank you, Ryan, for the commission. Ash, Big D, we have a couple emails in this week about some of our past pods and requests for new ones. Well, the first one we have from Matt in France, and this is about Hook, and it says, Hi, I discovered your podcast recently and already listened to three episodes. You're doing a great job, but you completely destroyed Hook, which is a great movie. You took it too seriously. It's a movie for kids, first of all. Robin Williams not funny because you didn't laugh out loud like you did with Dumb and Dumber? Come on. Kiss Matt from France. Yeah, Matt, you... You just said it right there. (laughs) It's because I did not laugh out loud like I did with Dumb and Dumber. That's what's wrong with the movie. It's just a shitty movie. Hook Hook isn't good. Rufio is amazing. Hook, 
kind of sucks. Yeah, Matt, and we appreciate the the support, but one of the things is exactly what you described. As kids, we might have loved it. I remember liking it as a kid, but as an adult, it's a different story. And that's does the movie age well for us? I mean, we change over time. And the, the true gems to me are the ones that were good when we were kids and they're still good to us now. Hook just doesn't fit that criteria. Yeah, like the Goonies, because the Goonies does. Write back and let us know where in France you're from, Matt. I'd love to know. All right. Up next, we have one from Jen. And Jen says, hi, Shot Crew. As I'm writing this in September of 2022, I know that it will most likely be 2024 before this commission <laughs> sees the Shot meter. But nonetheless, I'm up for the wait. For my very first commission, I would like to hear your take on Peggy Sue Got Married. It is a fantastic cast of Nicolas Cage, Helen Hunt, and a very young Jim Carrey. But the star of this flick is definitely Kathleen Turner as Peggy Sue. The riveting performance and emotional moments contrast, however, with the absolutely ridiculous time travel plot that even with full suspension of disbelief, makes no sense whatsoever. For me, this is a solid 1.5 wipes, but I can't wait to hear your take on it, even if the waiting is two years into the future. Keep up the excellent work, and I hope you choose to approve this commission. All the best, Jen. I feel like we're victims of our own success here, and it's being exaggerated just a little bit, Jen. We're not into 2024 yet, I don't think. I mean, no. We're getting there, but we can still get this in next year, I believe. Yeah, October. October of 2023. Yeah, I, I think this is definitely, we have to do this. It's a great movie. It's just the ridiculous premise of seeing Kath, a grown-ass Kathleen Turner pretending to go back in time as a teenager. It is, it's, it's something we have to do. It'll be very good. I just look forward to the problematic nature of the film. It's going to be great. Well, thanks so much, Jim. We're looking forward to it. Up next, we have one from Dan E. And he says, Shat Crew, love the podcast. I started listening accidentally after asking Spotify to play the Dumb and Dumber soundtrack and got you instead. Needless to say, it was a welcome error. And what a movie to start with. Zero wipes. I noticed that Streets of Fire is missing from the Pantheon. Are there any plans to watch this one? If not, is the going rate for review still $150? Thanks for the Shat-filled commutes, Dan E. I love that you discovered us through the Dumb and Dumber <laughs> soundtrack uh, error. That's that's absolutely amazing, Dan. Um, I would love to do Streets of Fire, another neo-noir film. So it kind of falls into the same sort of roughly category as some of the other movies we've done recently. Uh, but yeah, Willem Dafoe, Motorcycles, I'm 100% in. What was the one with Morris Day? Uh, it was... Uh, Morris Day? Fuck, there was another one, Streets of something. I'm trying to... Streets of Fire, but no, this is a very... Like chariots of fire? <laughs> no, no, no. I'll look it up after, but I'll send it to you. But yeah, this, I mean, this looks interesting. Big D, are you still like drunk from your cruise? cruise? It's possible. It was. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I haven't. I haven't drank much. Like, pro but prior to this weekend, I hadn't drank in four months. So I more than made up for it on this cruise that I just got back from. So my brain is operating much slower today. So I apologize. And shout out to everybody who uh, responded to Big D's. Uh, <laughs> Green Opigio post uh, by showing us the things they're drinking, uh, especially mm -hmm. uh, Scott out there showing us how to shotgun the Coors Bankies. We appreciate you. Well, thanks so much, Dan. And last tonight, we have one from Jeff G. And he writes in to say, hey, Shatters, I've been listening a long time and have wanted to commission a film from day one. Last year, we lost a great friend way too early. This commission is dedicated to B-Rad. After listening to the Lady Hawk episode, I decided it's finally time to bust out the best Rudger Hauer film for review, at least in my opinion, The Blood of Heroes. You may ask yourself, how does one decide which Rudger Hauer movie is the best? I'll tell you. Through my college years, I worked at a chain video store, not Blockbuster, not Hollywood Video, but the one and only video update, formerly movies. We had so much fun working in that store, and I still remember when we put the first DVD on the shelf, Blade. In the summer of 99, my roommate Tom and I also worked testing concrete on construction sites. It was hot and exhausting work in North Carolina in July and August. We would come home, drink beers, build puzzles, and watch movies. Having first seen The Blood of Heroes in my friend Daniel's basement in high school and loving it, it made an early appearance that summer. From there, Tom and I decided to watch every Rudger Hauer video we could get our hands on, and we watched them all. Blade Runner, no comment on that shot score. Blind Fury, Lady Hawk, The Osterman Weekend, Split Second, Surviving the Game, Cross Worlds, and more I'm probably blocking out. 
But it all comes back to the blood of heroes. What's not to love? A post-apocalyptic wasteland where the best and maybe only entertainment is a game where people beat the shit out of each other, trying to get a dog skull on a stake while a drunk old man throws rocks at a round sheet of metal. I watched it recently and it still holds up for me. It's a zero white movie? No. Are y'all going to shout all over it? I sure hope so. But I hope you enjoy. Thanks and keep the reviews coming. And P.S. Let me know when you open up the 2000s. Euro Trip is begging to be commissioned. And that comes from Jeff G. Is this Jeff G writing about a movie we've already agreed to do? Or is this his pitch to get us to do it? I'm still trying to figure that part out. I think it's his pitch. It's, a, it's, it's his pitch. It's I impressive. Think. I am in. I mean, the oh way you God. described it, I'm I'm in. Holy shit. I'm watching just a little preview. This looks great. This looks like we wrote this movie. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes. It's going to be amazing. This reminds me of RoboJocks. This could be our equivalent of RoboJocks, that type of film. <laughs> this looks amazing. I love that every time you say the title of Robot Jocks, it gets shorter. <laughs> Oh, it's like it was robot. robot jocks and it's robo jocks. Pretty sure it's going to be like Rojo <laughs> or Rojocks. 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 Don't drink, kids. Don't drink. Thanks, Jeff. We'll get in touch with you <laughs> about uh, commissioning the Blood of Heroes and we'll get in touch with all of you about your commission request. Big D, what do we have coming up next week? Gene, next week, FBI criminal profile Will Graham is called out of early retirement to assist in a serial murder case involving a killer known as the Tooth Fairy. Graham enlists the help of imprisoned serial killer, the cannibal, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, who is the reason Graham took early retirement. Soon, Graham and the FBI are entangled in a deadly cat and mouse game between the tooth fairy, Lecter, and an interfering journalist. This was commissioned by Omar I. It was released on my birthday in 1986. And uh, this is a great prequel that a lot of people don't know exists. I've never seen it. I'm really excited for this one. It's good. It's I don't know if it's as good as the one with Edward Norton, but it's good. Well, thank you, Omar, for the upcoming commission. Thank you, Ryan, for commissioning Dark City. Thank you to all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shath Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media, share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shath the Movies. Email us, host at shathemovies.com. You can leave us a voicemail at shatpod.com by using the speak pipe feature. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all that information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV. Wherever we're fine podcasts can be found, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Join us next week for the following movie. sliding door nationwide victims yeah this is will graham of the fbi one killer this is what the subject's teeth look like Agent Will Graham, Manhunter.